Um, well, good afternoon and um, thank you to the organisers for allowing me to come along and uh, present today. Um, I'm going to share some research from um, a project I first undertook in, in 2009, which happened to be funded by the um, OFM, DFM's Gender Equality Section. Um, and it looked at the relationship between candidate selection and um, the underrepresentation of women in, uh, in Northern Irish politics. Um, since that project, I've gone away and I've, um, I did a further research project on party organisation more generally in 2013, um, but it also touched on the issue of candidate selection. So armed with that more recent research, I'm going to update my findings from 2009. So it's, today is really a sort of hybrid or a merger of those two projects. Um, as the chair of the session already noted, it seems quite an apt time to present research which touches on the issue of political gender inequality, uh, given yesterday was International Women's Day, we're now halfway through the inaugural um, Assembly Women's Week. Sunday was Mother's Day. Um, and I also believe that at one o'clock today, the uh, Women's Policy Group, which is an umbrella body for a wide range of women's associations, they officially launched their Women's Manifesto for the upcoming um, Assembly elections. Um, and with that election just around the corner, we're obviously given uh, added reason to really reflect on the makeup of the institutions here at Stormont where gender continues to represent a key factor when it comes to access to political office. Um, the Assembly has been dubbed one of the most unequal legislatures in Western Europe, and certainly by both regional and international standards, the, uh, the extent of political gender disparity here is, is, is pretty stark. Um, so by way of context, um, just 69 women have been elected to the Assembly since 1998, which represents 16% of the total number of MLAs. Um, and as you can see, the, the Assembly lags quite a distance behind its, uh, its sister assemblies in Scotland and Wales. Um, it's yet to breach the 20% mark, um, and those other assemblies have in every, every election surpassed that sort of all-important mark of 30%, which is uh, widely recognised as the, uh, the mark you need to hit to reach a critical mass of elected women to then encourage uh, gains in the future. Um, Beyond the Assembly, uh, you can also see a gender imbalance at local council level. Um, and although there's been a sort of clear and positive trend um, or improvement in the numbers of women elected to council since 1977, um, they still account for less than a third of councillors today. Um, indeed, if you take the, uh, the average growth rate of, say, 2% from the last four elections, um, then it would be 2066 before we'd see full, uh, full equity, gender equality at, at council level. So that's just half a century. Um, I'm not going to dwell on, on the, the figures in this slide or the next one uh, for too long, just to make the point that uh, the record of the main parties in Northern Ireland differs in respect to political gender equality. Um, at assembly level, there's a clear uh, nationalist and unionist sort of split or divide, with Sinn Féin and the SDLP consistently boasting a, a higher number of women MLAs than the DUP and UUP. Um, Alliance's record is, is also, relatively speaking, uh, quite strong, albeit with a, with a bit of fluctuation. Um, again, if we turn to, um, to council level, you see a, a similar picture, um, albeit a slightly messy one, but there's a clear difference between um, the unionist parties and the SDLP, Sinn Féin and Alliance. Um, and again, there are some fluctuations in party performance. So the DUP has shown a sort of steady improvement over time, um, while the UUP is uh, sort of you would around the 15% the, uh, mark. Um, last year, uh, or in 2014, the SDLP saw quite a, quite a significant leap from around 25% uh, to just shy of 40%. Um, but yeah, for today's purposes, the graph is really just there to show that some parties fare better on the issue, um, but none of them um, reach uh, you know, full, full equity. There's an overall issue of um, underrepresentation. Okay. Uh, Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the low number of women elected to political office is, is underpinned by a similarly low number of uh, women, women selected to actually contest elections. So it's not the case that the Northern Irish electorate isn't voting for women, it's that women represent the minority of candidates on the actual ballot. Um, and again, we see a general picture of inequality and a divide between the two unionist parties and the rest when it comes to the number of women um, selected as candidates. Um, now, I should preface this slide with um, the idea that it's, not, it's, it's important to acknowledge that the graph doesn't, uh, doesn't account for the success rates of those women candidates. Um, 
raw numbers aren't really everything in this case. Um, what matters is if women are elected, and, and oftentimes women are, are selected to contest seats which are, um, in essence, unwinnable. But the point again is that uh, we can observe a sort of clear overall disparity in the gender of candidates when it comes to assembly elections. Um, so how best to sort of explain or account for that underrepresentation? Um, well, the answer is, is complex. Um, generally speaking, political gender inequality is a sort of is a multi-dimensional problem. It's quite a heady mix of, of a range of different factors. But the so-called classic obstacles, they're often uh, often conceptualized as the five C's. Um, and I'll just, I'll just run through them. So firstly, we have confidence, uh, where women are less likely to seek selection. They're more critical in their self-assessment or their, their self-appraisal, and they need more encouragement to sort of make that leap or that transition from activist to candidate. Um, in terms of cash, women have less access to the financial resources that are needed to sort of cultivate a political career and fight a campaign. Uh, on political culture, the, the highly sort of masculinized or often aggressive nature of politics has been shown to be a turnoff for women in many cases. Uh, when it comes to childcare, the division of labor um, in terms of domestic caring responsibilities places women at a disadvantage when it comes to uh, their involvement in politics. Um, and that's a situation that's often made worse by uh, sort of gender insensitive institutional practices. Um, and finally, we have uh, the focus of today, which is candidate selection, where women can be either discriminated against or disadvantaged in the actual institutional process of selecting candidates for election. Um, okay, it's at this point I'd love to just click on a five minute video. <laughs> um, so uh, what does candidate selection actually look like in Northern Ireland? So I'm gonna quickly just walk through uh, each of the, the parties, the, the, f the five main parties, their formal procedures for assembly elections. Um, and these are taken from what I hope are the latest official party rule books um, and the interviews that I've conducted over the years with different party actors. Um, I should say, if you have trouble seeing the, the slides, they're, they're in the, the appendix of the, of the briefing paper. Okay, so if we take the DUP first, uh, candidates have to firstly make it onto a central shortlist, uh, and that shortlist and that that um, that act of shortlisting candidates is a fairly new development that was introduced uh, in 2013. After that, you have a uh, a second stage, which can be described as twin track. So the party leadership can select a set number of candidates, and party members at constituency level can also select a set number of candidates. And again, that 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 twin track approach is actually fairly well established practice for the DUP, um, although the number of candidates that can be selected by party leadership has actually increased since 2013. It used to be that the party leaders uh, could only put forward one sort of wild card candidate, but they've actually lifted that cap um, so they can, they can put forward as many candidates as they see fit. Um, and then moving on, you have a third stage, which is where all the candidates will go to in front of the party's executive, but um, which is essentially uh, a sort of rubber stamping stage. Uh, when it comes to the Alliance Party, you see a similar first stage to the DUP, uh, where candidates are screened and shortlisted by the party centre, and then those candidates face a final selector, which is made up of party members at constituency level. Um, and historically speaking, that, that sort of two-stage approach, um, that's been the norm since Alliance's uh, foundation in, since 1970. Uh, okay. Uh, the UUP's process is by far the most complex of the main parties, or at least it has the, the, the potential to be. Uh, candidates first seek admittance onto a central shortlist, and they then face a selector of party members at uh, constituency level. Um, and at this stage, if required and if possible, party members will select twice the number of candidates that are set to stand in the election. So if, uh, if the party wants to run two uh, candidates in a constituency, party members will select four. Um, and just to make things extra complicated, at that stage, the party leadership can also add a candidate to that list. All those candidates are then interviewed by party officers who then determine who the final candidate or candidates shall be. Um, and that's a fairly new approach for the UP. Um, prior to 2007, candidates were really just selected by local party members with uh, really no opportunity at all for the leadership to really influence proceedings. So recent years have seen a real um, and distinct centralization of the process uh, in the UUP. Um, set against that, the SDLP's process is fairly straightforward. So candidates first make their way onto a central shortlist. Um, that's a fairly recent development that was introduced in 2004 originally, um, but I'm led to believe that it's really only been used consistently since 2011. 
Um, candidates are then selected by party members at the constituency level, um, and that's a decision which is really treated as the last word. So while the party leadership can add a candidate to the ticket at the end, they can't overturn a decision that's taken by the party membership. They're sort of, they're sort of stuck with that choice. Um, as for our last party, uh, Sinn Féin, um, its candidates are uh, originally selected by party members of local branches within the relevant constituency. Um, and unlike the other main parties, um, Sinn Féin doesn't shortlist the candidates before they face uh, the party membership. Rather, instead, the names chosen by the members go forward to the party executive, who, after an interview process, will either ratify or veto the candidacy. Um, and that stage, again, of selection by party members, followed by approval at leadership level, that's long-standing practice for Sinn Féin. Um, and it should be said that Sinn Féin is the only main party here um, to adopt an internal gender quota for selection, uh, who stipulate at least 30% uh, of those on, on final candidate lists should be women. Okay, so that's the sort of the dry stuff, the, the, the nuts and bolts of the party's processes. But what does the overall picture look like and how does that relate to this issue of, of women's political underrepresentation? Well, generally speaking, um, candidate selection is a a local job for local people. Um, without doubt, an integral stage of the process for all the parties involves ordinary party members at grassroots level with selection occurring on a sort of one member, one vote basis. Um, indeed, there's a, there's a long history and tradition of grassroots membership involvement in candidate selection in Northern Ireland. And that's not necessarily typical of, that tradition at least isn't typical of parties in uh, many other cases. Um, and I've lifted just some excerpts from, from interviews um, that show really how candidate selection is, is treated as a real, or is regarded as a key incentive for party members to not only remain within the organization, but to be active within the organization. So their stake in, in choosing a candidate, their involvement in the process, that's really essential for encouraging and sustaining a, a high rate of activism, which itself is vital to parties um, campaigning and fundraising efforts. Um, and that's probably typified best by the SDLP MLA who describes uh, selecting a candidate as the lifeblood of a local political party. And as a result, party leaders are often typically very reluctant to interfere with a process which is sort of widely regarded as the preserve of, of local activists. They, 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 they tread lightly for fear of sort of disenchanting large swathes of the, of the rank and file. Um, now, crucially, the fact that Candidate selection is a highly local affair that occurs at constituency level, sort of far away from, from party headquarters. That could be serving to disadvantage women and sustain existing levels of political gender inequality. So comparative research demonstrates how parties which implement uh, that sort of localized and inclusive process, one that many of us might consider to be democratic, um, actually find it difficult to produce a socially representative list of candidates. So there's a negative relationship between highly decentralized selection procedures of the kind we have here um, and the political representation of women. So smaller, more exclusive selectorates are more capable of essentially balancing a candidate ticket. Um, that said, it's, it's clear from the overview as well that parties in Northern Ireland don't throw the decision entirely over to their, their party membership. There are a range of opportunities which exist for party leaders or party leadership teams to influence proceedings, whether it's through shortlisting, uh, ratification, or nominating a candidate. Um, indeed, there's been a real and clear centralization of uh, candidate selection methods in recent years. All the parties, with the exception of Alliance, have, um, have tweaked their procedures or reformed their procedures to allow for a greater degree of central oversight and control. Um, so all parties, um, in essence, possess measures which permit leaders to influence the representative profile of their candidate ticket, um, short of a quota or, or other um, you know, means of, of positive discrimination. Um, and the party leaders are acquiring uh, greater decision-making authority compared with party members should therefore be a welcome development um, or a positive one in terms of political gender equality. Um, the party's selection procedures have, from a theoretical standpoint, or on paper at least, become more women-friendly in recent years. Um, 
And when I interviewed those, those involved in introducing those reforms, it was clear that the changes were partly motivated by the party's desire to produce a more balanced, representative candidate slate, primarily in terms of gender, but also um, when it comes to age and also uh, geographical spread within, within the constituencies. Um, so the involvement of the party centre, as the SDLP MLA puts it, it enables consideration of a, a sort of much broader a uh, bigger picture than is possible at the constituency level if it's just left to party members. If there's that degree of central oversight, you're more likely to get um, or be able to be in a position to uh, pr produce a more balanced ticket. Um, now, while there are reasons to be positive in light of those recent organisational developments, candidate selection is also an issue of supply. Um, for women to be selected by candidates or as candidates, they must first seek selection. Um, and on this point, my um, earlier research found that all parties in Northern Ireland confessed to suffering from uh, a, a really weak supply of female aspirants at all levels, assembly and local council. Um, those I interviewed consistently argue that the low levels of women involved in politics owes more to that deficit of women coming forward than um, sort of overt discrimination in the, in the selection process itself. Um, and repeated reason or repeated references made to um, to our five C's. So in Northern Ireland, there are long-standing, uh, widely shared traditional conservative attitudes to uh, towards domestic and childcare and responsibilities. There's a, an aggressive, masculinized political culture uh, which is off-putting to women and has been so for decades. Um, women also appear to suffer from a sort of chronic lack of confidence when it comes to putting themselves forward for selection. Um, many just regard themselves as, as lacking the required skill set to stand um, and the onus is often placed on their being invited to put their name forward uh, for selection. Um, and on these obstacles to women's political participation, as the, as, the chair, uh, as the chair referred to, the Assembly and Executive Review Committee's report last year on women in politics uh, contains several recommendations as to how they can be effectively tackled or addressed. Um, what's most important from my reading of that document is that the recommendations remove responsibility for increasing women's representation from individual women and place uh, it squarely on the shoulders of political parties, uh, the Assembly and the Executive. Um, Northern Ireland's yet to, to witness an election which could be regarded as a, as a watershed in terms of political gender equality similar say to, to um, what's just happened in, in, in the Irish case. Um, given the low numbers of women selected by the main parties to date, 2016 is, uh, is highly unlikely to see a sort of great leap uh, in the numbers of women actually elected to the Assembly. Um, and again, to reiterate the point, responsibility for addressing that rests primarily with political parties, not least their approach to candidate selection. So it's through the support and encouragement they provide to their women members to seek selection uh, their willingness on the part of central party leaderships to really take advantage of the new powers that they've often fought quite hard to, to obtain in the process, um, and also their efforts to educate the grassroots, their grassroots members, the, the, those who remain the most influential actors, um, on the importance of achieving a gender balance and, and putting forward a balanced ticket. Um, if there are women operating in the background of party politics, um, what's preventing them from taking that next step into elected office? Um, and on this, the recommendations outlined in the Assembly's report should really represent the absolute minimum required effort for the institutions and, most importantly, the political parties themselves.